Hello everyone, as the Solidarity with Others International Association, we continue to our right to talk interview series from where we left off. And today's speaker is Lucy Hal from Amsterdam. She completed her PhD in International Relations at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. And she is currently a researcher and a lecturer at University of Amsterdam. Her work considers the intersection of gender, violence, and protection in refugee and humanitarian protection. Um, yeah, <laughs> and if you're ready, <laughs> we can continue with the questions, but if you want to add anything, we can no, listen to you. Perfect, that was a lovely introduction, thank you. Okay, great. Then. Um, my first question is, what would you like to say about International Human Rights Day? Yeah, I was thinking about I've been thinking about this a lot because I do find it quite hard to celebrate Human Rights Day when we're seeing so many human rights instruments and so many human rights violations just be completely ignored and sidelined by a lot of states and institutions. Um, so I'm a little bit... <laughs> I think I'm, yeah, I'm finding it quite a sad thing to reflect upon, but I also, I do think it is important in acknowledging the state of the world that we live in right now and the depths of violence and the depths of human rights violations that we do sort of stop and pause and recognise that we have got human rights law, we have accountability mechanisms. And I think it is good to sort of stop and recognise and celebrate those as achievements. Um, but yeah, the current state of the world shows us that we've still got a lot of work to do. And yeah, so I think I think it is really good to sort of celebrate Human Rights Day and at the same time, like really remain focused on the immense amounts of suffering and the massive human rights violations that are going on as we speak. Um, so I think I feel quite double about Human Rights Day, where it's like, yes, this is great, we should celebrate this, but at the same time, we really need to be reflecting on the limitations of human rights instruments and be thinking critically and creatively about how to address human rights concerns because, yeah, yeah, it's a really sad state of the world right now. Yeah, you're right, thank you. And my second question is from your perspective, like um, how might the integration of sexual and reproductive health care into atrocity prevention policies impact global efforts in promoting human rights and preventing mass atrocities? Uh, this is a great question. Um, so thanks for asking it in the first place. But I think how I sort of came at this question of sexual and reproductive health care in connection to things like genocide and ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity is thinking about how, first of all, these are particular human rights violations um, and they need to be addressed at the appropriate level of law, whether that be domestic, international, uh, local, but also addressing the short and long-term implications of these types of violations. So in my work on responsibility to protect, I've really looked at how the four crimes that R2P is interested in, genocide, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing and war crimes, how that framework really does bring about a different set of possibilities and limitations for how we understand sexual violence, but also how we understand reproductive justice and reproductive violence within that. So recently we've seen R2P reports sort of flag these questions around compulsory birth control, um, which is kind of like a reference to the Genocide Convention where we do see language about preventing births within a group. Um, and I, I kind of find these interesting sort of connections between like compulsory birth control um, and preventing births within a group like these are ways that we can think through existing international law to understand reproductive violence in relation to these big international crimes. Um, but I, I also think like there's that top level of justice, but there's also sort of how this impacts um, individuals, how this impacts families, how this impacts communities. And while it's important to have these sort of like international legal perspectives or international justice perspectives, 
we also need to be thinking about okay how how do you know how do these types of violations affect people in the long term because we know from situations like the the use of sex slaves um in by the Japanese military in South Korea that a lot of women who experienced that violence like became infertile like they were not able to to go on and, and have children um and I think we're also seeing you know these questions of how to look after people who have experienced um reproductive violence um this is becoming more and more a concern in humanitarian programming but if we look at what's happening in places like Gaza in places like Sudan and the DRC Congo like they, these are attacks on reproductive health and I think there needs to be an increased sense of urgency to understand how violations of reproductive rights, acts of reproductive justice, should be considered constitutive of crimes against humanity. Um, to sort of have this like multi-level approach where we are looking at it in relation to what could the ICC prosecute potentially, but also looking to see, okay, how can we provide um, support? How can we provide, like often it's life-saving medical interventions. Um, how can we provide that in, in a context of mass atrocity prevention um, and responding to mass atrocity crimes at the same time? So that might sound really ambitious, uh, but I think, you know, putting these things on the agenda, like they are on the agenda, like this is not me just sort of saying like we should care about this, like there are statements around including reproductive health care in mass atrocity prevention frameworks um, and so I think it's our job now to really be thinking about, okay, what does that look like? You know, how do we provide um, safe access to abortion? How do we provide care for women who have been um, sterilised without their consent? Or how do we provide care for people who have had an IUD implanted without their consent? Um, how do we seek justice? And how do we look after their sort of psychological and physical well-being? Yeah. Sorry, that's a lot of <laughs> a lot of information. It's a, it's great, really. Um, well, as you know, different groups and ethnicities, basic human rights are being violated from China to Turkey at this very moment. And to prevent these violations, what can or should people and the NGOs do? Yeah. I mean, I I think it's. I often think about like really. They're not simple things because it's very difficult to talk about these things, but raising awareness and letting people tell their stories on their terms. Um, so creating space for people who have experienced these types of violations to, to be listened to and to be taken seriously, I think is a step in, in a direction that can help. Um, but also thinking about how victims of these violations can move towards seeking a sense of justice in a way that aligns with how they understand justice and whether that's criminal accountability at an international court, whether that's local accountability um, at a domestic level, or whether that's reparations um, financial support, educational support, like there are many different ways that NGOs and people can understand justice. Um, and I think starting from how people tell their stories um, is a really important place. I think maybe also more practical, well, not practically, because this is also really difficult, but NGOs can assist in collecting evidence, they can collect testimonies. Um, so if people like, you know, we, we know at many levels that like if people have experienced these types of violations, it's quite difficult in that moment to decide to seek criminal accountability or to decide to take what happened to you to a court of law. But what NGOs can do is assist with evidence collection, with collecting that information, with collecting that story and keeping it safe so that maybe a week later, maybe a month later, maybe years later, there are questions around justice that those people want to seek and that that information is there. Um, but keeping, I mean, I don't usually use the word victim, but keeping the victim very central to how that information is, is managed. 
Um, but I think also going back to what I was saying about, you know, the healthcare aspect. Um, so the provision of healthcare, psychological care, because reproductive violence, like this, these are the sorts of violences that cause lifelong injuries. Um, it impacts people in their day-to-day -day lives, their ability to have jobs, their ability to have relationships, their ability to have children, their ability to live their lives on the terms that they want to live them on. Um, so I think it's really important to have healthcare workers and humanitarian workers understand and be familiar with how to do trauma-informed care and trauma-informed psychological and, and medical care. Um, because, yeah, as I said, you know, we a lot of the times these sorts of violences leave women or leave other people with um, infertility issues, with chronic pelvic pain, uh, with sexually transmitted infections, um, unintended or you know unwanted pregnancies, um, and and also just deeply infects, deeply impacts. Sorry, not infects. <laughs> thinking about infections, which is one thing, but also thinking about the impact on how people understand their own bodies and their own sense of um, sexuality is, is all part of taking care of people in the aftermath of these types of violations. And I think we're starting to do that better, but it's it's still early days. And I think there's still not enough resources and money and attention um, available. Yeah, thank you. Um, like, um, okay. Well, on the one hand, um, social media is being used as an instrument to separate the hatred against some groups in different countries. But like the flip side of the coin, on the other hand, it's the channel by which people enjoy the right of freedom of expression. So we have to have a balance, right? Um, like what can be done to minimize circulating the hatred on social media without infringing the right to freedom of expression? Mm. This is again, this is such a good question. I, I mean, I'm not laughing because this is a nice thing to talk about, but I'm laughing because you know, whenever I engage with social media, I'm in the back of my mind, I'm also thinking this is a business. Like this is social media is a platform. It has a business model. There is a function there that is about consumerism and capitalism. And this, I think this is sort of how I get at this question of like, how do we, how do we understand um, social media as somewhere where like we can share information. And I think in terms of the activism that I've been involved in recently, all of it has been facilitated through social media. Um, all of the information about sit-ins, about protests, about campaigns to support um, the trial at the International Court of Justice on behalf of Gazans and the genocide tribunal there, no, the genocide case there, sorry. Um, all of that is very much facilitated through social media. And as you said, on the other hand, then you have incredible amounts of disinformation, misinformation, you know, people willfully spreading false allegations, false information, which is also fueling this violence um, and violence elsewhere. So, I, sorry, this is a really roundabout way of sort of saying, I think there needs to be definitely better laws and policies around the spreading of hateful information. Um, and I think a lot of the times like hate speech, incitement to violence, laws and legislation, it does exist. But when it's sort of in this online space, you know, when things can be done with relative anonymity, um, like I, I, I do feel like there is a gap there between how hateful messages are spread and its impact on the targeted the people who are the targets of that hate and how to actually address the people spreading it. Um, I think, you know, police and security apparatus also don't really know how to do this very well. I mean, I've been on the, I've been on the receiving end of like rape threats and death threats and I've reported them and I've spoken to the police about them. And I remember saying to them, like, you know, what happens if this person turns up at my door? And they said, well, yeah, that's when you can give us a call. And I was like, this is not enough. <laughs> like, this is really not enough um, to make me feel safe. So I, I do sort of find from both my, you know, 
the intellectual work that I have been doing around these questions of hate speech, particularly gendered hate speech online, but also my own personal experiences, which is there's not enough understanding out there amongst the people who are, have the power to make change, to make the change that is necessary to make people feel safe. And I think, you know, going back to where I started, which is this question of, you know, democratic engagement and activism, you know, if, if there are people like me, and I know it's not just me, I know it's many people from many different marginalised backgrounds where we take ourselves offline because it's not a safe space. And I think what happens then to our ability to engage in a meaningful politics of peace or a meaningful politics of democracy when we can't feel safe in these online spaces you know and I think there is quite a it's quite not easy because this is also difficult but like if you are exposed to physical violence in offline people can see that they can put their they can that's easier for them to understand why that's wrong but I think when it comes to hate speech and when it comes to you know misogyny um and transphobia, like these are still things that aren't well understood by police, by laws, um, but they have a very big impact on the people who receive those messages or the people who see those messages online. Um, so that may be a lot more done. Yeah, and going, I mean, again, a lot of social media is about consumerism and there's a business model there and I think unless, unless companies, unless tech companies are sort of forced to reckon with their business model, I don't know that they're going to really change their interests in moderating content, um, which kind of leads us to our next question. So I'll, yeah, <laughs> I've got more to say on that. <laughs> I agree with every word of you because like um, when it comes to freedom of speech, we know that in, even in ACHR case law and mm -hmm. even it comes to like the having a uh, right to have a private life sometimes we see that ACHR having hard time to find the balance between them and making putting some tasks on some, with case laws and stuff but when it comes to like hate speech we know that there is lack of like European consensus mm. and when it comes to online hate speech mm. even in 2024 we are we don't still have enough laws for the technology so yeah yeah. <laughs> so you are absolutely right with every words okay so my last question for today is according to last report some social media companies jump from their responsibilities in developing and non-developed countries mm. do you know why do they have such intentions do you have any idea yeah so it's I again great question and I've been thinking about this because I've been involved in another research project where we were looking at um, online misogyny so we were thinking about our roles as researchers and our roles as like we weren't really doing content moderation but it it did give us an insight because we were we were thinking as researchers we can kind of dip into these worlds of misogyny and violence against women in these online spaces and extract data and make sense of it and make an analysis and write a paper and, and write policy proposals but we're not, you know, our job is not content moderators and, and we as researchers can really think about, okay, how do we do this research, which is a form of content moderation because we were also reporting it. Um, how can we do this and look after our own mental health? And like, we could have conversations around that and we had resources in order to be able to do this work and do this research and protect ourselves and our mental health. When it comes to content moderation out there, like in Meta and in, in those types of places, again, it comes down, like, I just find this so problematic, but it's, it's this business model, right? Like, so in May, 2020, Meta reached a settlement of 52 million with US-based moderators who all developed post-traumatic stress disorder after working as content moderators because they are seeing and moderating the most horrendously awful imagery and language. Um, 
And so you have that on the one hand where it's like, okay, here's a settlement of 2 million that acknowledges that people develop PTSD from doing this work. At the same time, we also have testimonies from people who are working for Meta in Nairobi, in Kenya, who are doing the same work for $2.20 an hour without the same resources, without the same mental health support, without the same access to taking Meta to court to get a settlement. I mean, it shouldn't, it shouldn't get to the point where you need a settlement. People should be protected from these types of trauma in their workplace anyway. Um, but I think that the numbers that I was reading was that content moderators were being paid $15 an hour in the US versus $2.20 $2 in Kenya. And so this is, this is where I kind of go back to this thing of like social media, like how I kind of create a critical distance for myself. Cause I, I use Instagram, I use social media. And when I sort of need to break from it, I'm like, this is a business model. This is this this technology is set up to make money and it's making money from my data and it's having terrible consequences on many people. I will use it for what I think is good. Um, I use it to write. I use it to share information what, that I think is factual and useful. I use it to connect, but I also really try to disconnect from it as well every now and then, because I think you know, it's, yeah, I sound really Marxist when I say this, but there is a capitalist model operating behind and within and throughout how social media works and it's having really horrible consequences on people who work in this that don't have workers protection don't have mental health support um and are really suffering as a consequence so yeah another big area for legal reform um and for workers rights reforms as well yeah thank you so about social media, maybe we can say that it's like a fire. So we can cook with it or we can burn ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I've definitely done both. <laughs> we all do. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm i very fine with like people sharing images of, you know, if people find it important to share images of children in armed conflicts or children as, um, you know, as as victims of bombings, that's that's completely fine for them to do that but for me it's it, I've just developed a personal policy that I, I don't share that imagery um and it's not because I don't think it's important but it's I, I just I just for me I think geez like if that was my kid and all of a sudden they're body covered in blood and rubble was being shared on Instagram that's 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 a horrendous thought for me and I'm maybe I sound really critical of people who do do that because I maybe it is important but for me that's that's sort of a line that I've drawn for myself um so I will share text and I will share words and I will share information but um images of of children um is yeah and I think that really kind of my thinking around that really started with, um, you know, the bodies of children being washed up on European beaches and how those images went really viral, but ultimately didn't change how people thought about people seeking asylum and refugees. And so there's also a part of me that thinks, okay, if we can have all these images out there of children dying senselessly and it makes no difference, then I'm, I'm also just not going to share it. Um, but I will advocate in different ways. So that's a really dark note to end on. But yeah, I think I think a lot of us are kind of um, thinking about these questions right now of like what to share and what's useful and, and how to, if we have a platform, how to use it. Yeah, like we all have to be careful about it. Like we know that people feel like people have more feelings when they see a picture, like they when you when they visualize it, but even at war times, we have to also safeguard for the kids, like for their privacy, for their body, for their faces. Um, yeah, but that's so sad still. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, my questions are like this, <laughs> just this. Yeah. Um, 
it was really a great pleasure to have you and like I personally I learned a lot from you today <laughs> thank you you're welcome thanks for having me also like really great questions um it really gave me some time to like think and reflect which is not something that we all have time for but being able to sort of sit with these questions and 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 reflect on what it is that I'm doing day to day was was also really good for me so yeah thank you for creating this time and space I really enjoyed talking to you even though the content was pretty depressing <laughs> <laughs>